Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the channel. If you're new here and you enjoy listening to horror stories, join us by clicking subscribe down below. Please, could we get 600 likes on today's video? Let's begin. Using Tinder was never the greatest of ideas, but at some point in every single man's life, they start to get desperate. That's unless they just don't care at all which I find more and more men actually becoming nowadays. With the internet pee industry, we have a bunch of men who are having their needs met by simply looking into a portal screen. To me, this is absolutely terrifying. And when I study philosophy and history, it makes me think of the recent times we're going through. I like to think of myself as a normal, healthy, and traditional man. When I'm not around women, I tend to get bored. They bring light, energy, and vibrance to my life. And as cringy as that may sound, it's true. I believe it's the balancing energy to the masculine. And I'd been two whole years without even so much as being near a woman, which may sound weird. But where I worked, it was a machinery plant. So, as you can imagine, all 200 workers were men with pot bellies, over the age of 50, massive mustaches, and stinky armpits. Oh, and the butt crack hanging out from the jeans. Yeah, that was my sight on the daily. So, I guess you get the gist of it now. I was looking for my balance. I was looking for the feminine energy. And ultimately, I was looking for a wife. Using Tinder wasn't something that ever crossed my mind. As to be 100% honest with you, I didn't even know what it was up until recently. I'm in my 50s, so meeting women was a lot easier back when I was in my 20s. For one, I was a lot better looking, had way fewer wrinkles, had a slimmer stomach, and a better build on me. Secondly, there was not much internet dating going around really. I think there was some, but it was very basic. Most people would meet at clubs, bars, restaurants, diners, through family members, or mutual friends. That's naturally how people used to meet their wives or girlfriends. But nowadays, that's all changed. I see a calamity where the younger generation is at each other's throats. The competition seems gutless. It seems disgusting. And in a sense, I feel sorry for the young guys nowadays. When I got back home from one of my shifts, I was exhausted. And for a while, I'd been on call with one of my friends, Steve. He had been using Tinder for a few months and apparently had some success. But I was a bit hesitant, as to be honest. I knew he was quite a big liar. He was a good bullshitter would come up with the most stupid lies and somehow try and pass them as truth. He convinced me to try and download the app. When I hung up the call with him, I went onto the app store and typed in Tinder. Sure enough, this massive pinkish reddish background comes on with a white flame in the middle. I click on it and then tap install. Me being the oldie I am, I read through all the terms and conditions, all the guidelines and regulations. I must have been there for about 40 minutes, thinking that that was actually mandatory. What did I learn? Well, some really weird stuff about Tinder invading privacy and so on and so forth. Reading it did make me feeling a bit uncomfortable with the invasive nature of the setup process. I nevertheless completed the installation of Tinder intrigued by the prospect of potentially meeting someone new. After spending a considerable amount of time reading through the extensive terms and conditions, I finally launched the app and diligently followed the tutorial and tips for setting up a profile. I uploaded a main photo, filled in detailed information about myself, and answered a myriad of questions ranging from my smoking and drinking habits to my family aspirations, to 
Despite the somewhat invasive questions, I understood the rationale behind it. Women, understandably, want to know as much as possible about the men they might meet, especially in the absence of mutual acquaintances. Initially, my experience with Tinder was disheartening. Despite my efforts in tweaking my profile and even showcasing aspects of my life like my drug and time spent with nieces and nephews, matches were non-existent app's persistent nudges towards upgrading to Tinder Plus. Coupled with tantalizing notifications of obscured likes from users like Kelly and Anna, eventually wore down my resistance. The upgrade did offer a smoother experience and more features, but the initial excitement quickly waned as I realized that the profiles of those who supposedly liked me seemed suspiciously inauthentic. A month into my Tinder journey, I sought advice from my friend, who had claimed success on the platform. Armed with new tips and the advantages of Tinder Plus, I finally began to see some activity. Among the few matches I received was a young lady, 18 years my junior. This was unexpected. And while I found it odd that women in their mid to early 30s would be interested in someone my age, I couldn't help but feel a surge of excitement. We hit it off quite well, messaging back and forth for days, finding common ground despite our significant age difference. She was beautiful, studying medicine, and seemed to embody a blend of intelligence and allure that I found irresistible. Despite the promising start, I couldn't shake the nagging doubt back of my mind. The disparity between us, in terms of age, lifestyle, and physical condition, made me question the authenticity of her interest. Yet, the excitement of the connection propelled me forward, and we agreed to meet in person for coffee. Meeting her face to face only amplified her beauty and the apparent mismatch between us. Dressed elegantly, and with a radiant presence, she seemed even more out of my league. As we sat down for coffee, engaging in conversation and learning more about each other's lives, I couldn't help but feel like an imposter in this scenario, almost as if I was playing the role of a sugar daddy, an idea reinforced by the odd glances we attracted from those around us. Despite these reservations, I was determined to enjoy the moment, clinging to the hope that perhaps, against all odds, there might be a genuine connection. While sipping on the coffee, I noticed that something didn't quite sit right with me. I don't know what it was, but the girl started acting really weird and funny. At first, I thought that maybe she was just really nervous or had some issue with social anxiety, but it got way worse. She started having these tics where she would cough, but really aggressively. Then she would hold her forehead and put her elbows on the table, something my mom used to hit me for doing back in the day when I was a kid. From there, she would cough more aggressively halfway through the date, this girl started to look really ill. She looked up at me and said that she wasn't feeling too good. I asked her what was wrong and how she actually felt. She said she couldn't tell, but she felt dizzy and sick. I told her that it's probably best she goes home then, get some rest. That's when she told me that she didn't feel well enough to drive home. She drove to the coffee shop in her car and she lived a few miles out of town. Me, being kind and a respectful gentleman, offered her a lift back to her place in my truck. Little did I know that I was going back to a trap, and this girl wasn't even ill. She was acting. We got up at the coffee shop. I paid the bill and tipped the waitress on the way out. Her balance was awful. She was stumbling all over the place, 
times, I had to hold her by the shoulders to keep her upright and stop her from falling. A lot of people were looking and asking if she was okay. I started to get pretty worried for her and said that maybe we should call an ambulance. But the weird thing was, the second I mentioned calling an ambulance, she looked up at me and changed for a few moments. I don't need an ambulance. What am I dying? For that second, I saw a split personality, as if she had just healed instantly. She seemed scared that I might be actually ringing an ambulance with my cell phone, but I wasn't. I did as she asked, passed me, and I brought her back to my truck. I opened the door for her, popped her seatbelt on, and buckled her up. Then I shut the door and hopped in the driver's side. She gave me her address, so I punched it into the sat-nav. It was a 19-minute drive from where we were, which wasn't that bad. Could have been way worse. And at this point, I was still way more concerned about this girl's health and what was wrong with her. The last thing I wanted was to go on a Tinder date with a beautiful young lady and have her die on me or fall sick during the date. That's pretty much what was happening right now, or at least in my mind it was. During the drive back, she stayed silent the whole time few coughs here and there. When we pulled up at the house, there were a couple of lights on inside, which I found kind of weird. Seeing as it was the middle of the day, the lights were extremely powerful and seemed to be coming from the main room downstairs. I helped her get out of the truck and take the step down, which is fairly high, seeing as I have a ranger. I held her hand, shut the door behind her, and guided her up the footpath to her front porch. When she got there, she told me she wanted me to come in. She offered me a drink, so I went in with her and didn't think anything of it. I went in through the door and properly, and I could barely move my fingers. The nurses kept telling me to move certain fingers or to respond to different signals by squeezing their hands. After hours started to pass, I came around. I could now mumble and squeeze their fingers properly. Then, after another four or five hours, I could say simple words like, yes, no, please, and thank you. It took a whole two days for the effects of whatever they put in that coffee to wear off. And then finally, once it did, I explained what happened when the cops went to their house, searched the whole place, and found some equipment used to torture and harm humans. They had chairs with restraints, straps, gags, and even tools used to take out teeth, eyes, and fingernails. There were no human body parts or humans found in the house, other than the two old ladies, the man, and my Tinder date. The person that found me on the road thought that I was just having an issue with my body. They thought that I was having an allergic reaction, a stroke, or a heart attack. And for some weird reason, they didn't see me come out of that house. It was only once I was in the road that they knew where I was. The four people in that house never came out. They stayed in it, simply looking out the window thought they got lucky, and that they got away with what they did. But it was only a matter of time before I came around and could actually talk properly. I really think that the whole thing was disgusting. It was one big act to lure me in to possibly do something unspeakable and ungodly to my body and me. I could have taken it, but there are other people out there wouldn't have been able to go against whatever they put in that coffee. Whatever it was, they needed to make it a whole lot stronger for someone my size, which they didn't. And that's the mistake they made that led to me getting away. My date's dog tried to rip my leg to bits. I hadn't been on Tinder in around a few weeks. I had met a guy. He wasn't exactly my type, 
so I just stopped talking to him. He sent me a few more messages, but I ignored them all. And I think eventually, a week later, he got the hint to stop messaging me. I was out with my friends, and we were playing this game, going through each other's phones and checking the guys we were messaging. A couple of my friends were messaging tons, while Sophie was messaging only one. We found it cute that Sophie took this guy so seriously. He seemed like a typical nice guy, and I can wish nothing but the best for Sophie and the guy that she finally gets with. When it was my turn to have my phone gone through, I was absolutely terrified. I was terrified that they'd find something really embarrassing. Photos, videos, text messages, cheesy pickup lines, and random weird stuff that guys talk about when it comes to their fetishes and what they want. Just as a side note, the guys mentioning this wouldn't be my boyfriends, or even guys I'd spoken to for ages. Oh no, there'd be random strangers. Guys that had just matched with me on Tinder and decide to, straight up, ask the most private and personal question out of all of them. I get that starting with, hey, how are you, is boring. It's boring small talk, but it's respectful. And I prefer boring and respectful over needy and weird. I sat there as my four friends sifted through my phone. Their eyes were grinning, as well as their mouths. They seemed excited to find something embarrassing, and yet stupid at the same time. They went from my images all the way through to my videos. There were some awkward things they saw, but I'm pretty sure that either Sophie or Ella pretended they didn't see it and just kept swiping. I know I had some pretty revealing photos of myself saved on that phone, but friends are friends. And if they see something embarrassing, they're going to ignore it or try and make you feel better for it. After they had had my phone for a few minutes, I was sat down on the table opposite them, wondering how on earth they were going to find anything else. Well, I should have kept wondering, because they went as far as to text random people on my phone, which some would say is probably overstepping the mark. While they were texting people, including my grandma, auntie, and my old friends, they also texted a guy on Tinder. This guy's name was Steven. I'd matched with him a couple of weeks ago. And for some weird reason, out of the blue, Sophie had scrolled down through hundreds of guys that I've matched with over the past two years and found Steven. According to her, his profile picture stuck out because he had a massive golden retriever dog. When I finally realized that Sophie and my friends had organized a date for me to go out with Steven, I was nervous. They said that I had to do it though, as this game of truth or dare slash yes day means that I have to say yes within reason. When we have a true for dare yes day, it means that if someone asks you to do something, you have to say yes. We'd been doing this since we were around nine years old. And no joke, it's the funniest thing I've ever done in my life. Sometimes our friends took it a bit too far. Like, would you go and push that old man? Yes, but we wouldn't actually do things like that, as that was just out of order. This was my yes day, and they had dared me to go on a date with Steven. Well, they hadn't even dared me. They had set up the date for me and basically forced me to go on it. They messaged him for a couple of minutes, seeing as Stephen was online at the moment they stole my phone. They set out when I was going to meet him and where I was going to meet him. My friend Sophie started begging him to bring his dog on the walk, so he agreed. I briefly saw what Stephen had said in reply when I tried to come around the shoulder of Sophie. But every glimpse I got she would try and move the screen, 
and then walked to the other side of the table, stopping me from being able to see what she was typing. They had had my phone for maybe 10 minutes, when finally she puts it on sleep mode, turns the screen off, and pushes it to the other end of the table where I'm told to stay. I take the phone frantically, unlock it with the passcode, and take a look at the chat log. Between myself and Stephen on Tinder, it was a long one. They had been talking for quite a while and exchanged over 50 messages. I found the details of where I was meeting him, what time I was meeting him, and a whole bunch of other cringy stuff that I don't even want to mention in this story. I looked up at my friends. Revenge was etched over my face as I came up with all the ways to get back at them on their yes day. This was up there with some of the worst things they dared me to do. I was scared, meeting a guy I'd never seen in my life in a random park, walking his dog. It did seem a bit bizarre, awkward, and unnerving. But it was a yes day, so I had no choice. And even though the date took place on a different day, I had to say yes to it now. They had arranged for me to go on a date with him in two weeks' time. I had no idea why they picked that date. But it made sense closer to the time, as I realized that Ella was on holiday with her family in Spain for a week and a half. And their goal was to actually stalk me the entire time of the date. My friends offered to drop me off down there, so I agreed. On the journey to the park, my friends were trying to negotiate with me how this would pan out. They told me what to say, what to do, and how to act. I wasn't about to let them control everything about this date, even though it was kind of like a fun experiment. One big joke. We arrived at the edge of the park. Sophie dropped me off and told me where Stephen would be roughly. Then I walked to that area and just stood there waiting. I imagined the girls were just going to be watching, either by zooming in with their phones, or dare I say it, bringing their binoculars. Sophie has this absolutely massive pair of hilarious binoculars. And as I walked across the field to meet Stephen, I could just picture her behind rolling down the window and looking out with them in her eyes. I couldn't stop giggling to myself as I walked across the grass, imagining this thought. When I got over to the main area of the park, I couldn't see any sign of Stephen anywhere. I decided just to wait around, with my hands in my pockets. I'm quite a confident girl, and don't really feel self-conscious with people looking at me. So I just stood there, humming to myself, walking if I was waiting for someone. Sure enough, a guy turns up with a massive golden retriever, fluffy looking dog. My heart instantly melted into my lungs and I ran up to the dog to come and pat it. But as I got closer to the dog, the guy quickly grabs it by the leash and pulls its neck upright. I look at him as if to say, what the hell's going on? Then the dog starts growling at me. It starts snarling and showing its teeth. I backed away a little as I got scared and completely put off the dog and Steven. After that awful first encounter, I decided to stay on the other side of Steven to stay away from his dog. We introduced ourselves and then started walking a loop around the park. Steven seemed to be interested in me. He was asking me all different types of questions, and he was talking to me with the same energy that Sophie talks. It makes sense, though, seeing as Sophie was the one who was talking to him on Tinder, not me. We're around halfway around the park at this point. Every time I had even so much as looked into the dog's eyes, it would snarl and growl at me, showing its teeth. I made a big mistake. A cyclist was coming up the path in my direction. Stephen stopped walking as if he was nervous that the 
dog would also go for the cyclist. But that's not actually what happened. Subconsciously, I went to step out of the way of the cyclist. But instead of stepping to the left, I stepped to the right, right in front of the path of Stephen. As I stepped to the right, all of a sudden, as my right foot planted into the concrete, I felt the most excruciating shooting pain flaring up my leg. Then, as I looked down and started screaming, I realized that Stephen's dog had planted its teeth directly into my thigh and had now got a hold of my entire leg. I started screaming and panicking. Stephen started trying to pull his dog off me, which only made it worse. With every tug he gave of his dog's neck, it felt like the flesh off my bone was about to rip off. Then all hell broke loose. My friends, who were obviously watching this whole encounter, came running over. Sophie started trying to grab Stephen and have a massive go at him, while Ella and my two other friends started trying to grab the dog. Things turned nasty when the four girls came over. The dog started mauling, in other words, shaking its head around. This did considerable amounts of damage to my thigh, and I had to have a lot of my thigh reconstructed when I went to the hospital later that day. The dog eventually let go. I don't know why, and I don't know how, because for a good five minutes, it had latched onto my thigh and refused to let go. It had only started mauling when the girls came running over screaming. I think they made it all worse, but think about it. If Sophie hadn't have done this on the yes day, then I wouldn't have had to spend four weeks on crutches and having my thigh patched back together like I'm some kind of a Play-Doh doll. Stephen was so apologetic. He was even at the point of tears. I didn't press any charges. However, the dog was put down. This decision wasn't made by me, though. I think it was made by the cops or some type of animal control officer. When I heard the dog was put down, I got sad. But it did turn out it had a history of attacking people. There my friends were thinking they were setting me up with a date with a guy and a cute dog. It turns out it was a guy and a deadly dog. My Tinder date had a massive panic attack and urinated himself while in the middle of the bar. I feel a bit bad for sharing this, but it is anonymous. I won't give any names or names of places away, so I'll give him privacy. But by God though, I have to get this off my chest. It's both hilarious yet bad at the same time. When it happened to him, I really didn't know what to do. I felt severe secondhand embarrassment and just sort of getting up and leaving. Perhaps me not being there would have made it a whole lot better. I'd been talking to this guy on Tinder. Originally, I'd met him off of Tinder. Then somehow we met on Tinder again via matching three weeks after the guy hit on me in the library in August 2015. Then a couple of weeks later, I saw him on Tinder and swiped right. It turns out that he lived in the area. He was majoring in California. And at the time, I was traveling out to visit my parents. I had planned to stay there for most of the summer as the weather is absolutely stunning, but I didn't expect anything. Most of the time in California, I was bored. I didn't like most of the guys there, and there's a hell of a lot of tourism, not to mention all the lefties. I don't get on with many of them, and every summer I go back, they seem to be multiplying. Sorry if you're a lefty watching this, wink wink. I came up with the idea of trying to find some friends. Seeing as all my old friends that I used to go to high school with had just relocated. They went to universities in other states. Some even left the country and went to Europe to study and work. Life really does change from the age of 18 to 28, and sometimes not for the better. Although my studies were doing really well, 
became lonely. I felt like I needed someone to be with me. My mom and dad were in their early 70s, so I didn't really relate to them. And we did used to go out for dinners once in a while, but I'd never really spend time having long, thoughtful conversations with them. I just couldn't really do that. It made me feel kind of feeling uncomfortable, and I don't know why. When I met this guy on Tinder, it kind of lit my eyes up. I had a eureka moment. Oh, it's him. That's the guy that bumped into me in the library. The thing is, he didn't really bump into me, or he did. It depends on which way you look at it. Because I was reading, trying to find a book on something I was studying for coursework, when out of nowhere, this guy stepped back into me. I didn't really know what to do. So I just said, oh, sorry, like most people do. The guy said the same back and then decided to introduce himself and use this opportunity to try and hit on me. He wasn't that bad looking, but in the moment, I wasn't really interested in talking to guys as I was so fixated on trying to find this coursework book. He introduced himself, what he did, and roughly why he was there. It was pretty useless talk and it amounted to nothing. I could tell that the guy wanted to get my number but I was probably giving him the most deadly and horrible glare he's ever seen in his life. So that was his way of saying, right, this girl hates me. I'll just back away. I wish I'd been a little nicer, as I realize now how scared he probably was. But what happened on the second date made me really realize how scared he actually was. We hadn't talked on Tinder for very long, and we'd already started messaging over text. We had a call together one evening and started talking a little more. The focal point of the entire conversation was when we both walked back into each other in the library. It was the running joke, and we'd always laugh about it over and over, bringing it up whenever there was an awkward silence. The guy wasn't doing too bad for himself, actually. He was six years older than me and had a university major. He had also done a master's degree, which was pretty impressive, even if it was at a uni, which wasn't very prestigious. He was now working part-time, trying to find full-time work related to his achievements and qualifications, which in this day and age is near impossible. Once we'd stopped talking on our call, I went to sleep that night feeling really good. Talking to this guy made me feel warm inside. It gave me a fuzzy feeling, as if I was excited to see him next, which I really was. He was a lot more confident over the phone and over text, but that's understandable because being in person is totally different. When I met the guy for the second date, we arranged to meet up in a bar. I got there, and he was already there. He had booked the table, and we were going to have a meal and also share some alcohol and beverages and shots over the bar. We started drinking, and initially, right off the bat, the first thing I noticed was that this guy was extremely nervous. He was fumbling all his words and 10 minutes into the date, managed to knock over a glass and spill it all over the barista. We kind of giggled it off, but it was an awkward giggle. Then things only got worse from here. After knocking the glass over, he tripped up. Then he went to the toilet about eight times before we even had our first starter. I didn't really know what to think of him. This wasn't the guy I was talking to, was it? Maybe he wasn't very well, or maybe he was just intimidated by me or someone in the bar. I couldn't tell what was wrong. It didn't really cross my mind that maybe this guy no longer liked me, but that could have also been a possibility too. You never know. Once our starters were called, we walked back to our table and raised our hand. The waiter brought the starters over and we began eating. This is when I noticed 
that the guy was beginning to have a panic attack because he wasn't eating the food properly. He would chew it, and every time it would come to swallow the food, he would end up either chewing it again or place, or at least he would have informed me about his condition. The experience was eye-opening, to say the least. It taught me that everyone carries their own set of challenges and fears, some more visible and some hidden deep within, manifesting in moments you'd least expect. Swallow anxiety or phagophobia is indeed a real condition where individuals have an irrational fear of swallowing. It can lead to significant distress, especially in social situations like dining out. Watching him struggle, I could see the genuine fear in his eyes. A fear so palpable that it transcended the physical act of choking and transformed into a full-scale panic attack. It was a stark reminder of how powerful the mind is, capable of turning a routine act like swallowing into a life-threatening ordeal, at least in the perception of the sufferer. The staff's reaction was instinctual, aiming to dislodge what they believed to be a physical blockage, but the real obstruction was psychological. The incident with him urinating on himself only added to the intensity of the situation, marking an extreme physical response to his overwhelming anxiety. It's moments like these that you realize how complex and interconnected our mental and physical responses can be. His sudden departure and subsequent blocking on all communication platforms left me in a whirlwind of emotions. Initially, there was confusion and concern. Then a slow realization that perhaps this was his way of coping. By distancing himself from a situation that caused him such distress, it's hard not to take it personally, but it's also crucial to understand that his actions were likely not a reflection of his feelings towards me, but rather an attempt to protect himself from further anxiety. I often wonder how he's managing and if he sought help for his anxiety. It's a tough journey, but I sincerely hope he finds the strength and support to navigate through it. Situations like these serve as a reminder of the importance of empathy and understanding, especially when faced with behaviors that we might initially find perplexing or even frustrating. Everyone is fighting their own battles, some more silently than others, and a little compassion can go a long way. If you've been through a similar situation, I'm genuinely interested in hearing your perspective. It's not often we hear about a fully grown man experiencing such an extreme panic attack that it results in physical manifestations like wetting himself. The medics mentioned that based on the staff's accounts, this was one of the worst panic attacks they had seen, with his blood pressure and heart rate significantly elevated, alongside increased cortisol levels. It's possible he was taken home or to the hospital for further checks, where he might have received medication, perhaps beta blockers, which are sometimes prescribed for anxiety. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for making it to the end of tonight's video. If you enjoyed these stories, please subscribe and leave a like to show your support. I upload every evening to help you relax, get to sleep, or focus on your work. Your support for my channel, through comments and sharing your thoughts, greatly helps with the algorithm. Whether you want to offer advice to the people in the stories, criticize the stories, or simply share your opinions, your input is invaluable. Please share my videos with your friends, family, and on any social media pages you may have. I'll catch you in tomorrow's upload. 
stay well and take care of yourselves. <laughs>